Welcome to the video for chapter 29. Uh, today we're going to we're going to transition from really a focus on transmission lines to a focus on the things that tend to connect to transmission lines, which are antennas. Uh, we're going to talk about how is it that uh, we can use an antenna to create an electromagnetic wave. We're going to talk in particular about how is it that electromagnetic waves are created at all. And then we're going to focus on a particular type of an antenna, which is really a building block for other antennas. That's the infinitesimal dipole. So we'll, we'll talk about electromagnetic radi radiation first, then we'll talk about infinitesimal dipoles. So today our, our job is to first of all talk about the physical phenomenon that leads to radiation. Uh, and, and let me just clarify, when I say radiation here, I'm not talking about ionizing radiation that would be uh, like radioactive things. I'm talking about, uh, you know, the radiation of electromagnetic rays. So electromagnetic waves, things like, uh, you know, uh, things like ultraviolet light or visible light, things like that, uh, microwaves. We're also going to talk about calculating the electric field and magnetic field in the far field of an infinitesimal dipole, calculate the power radiating from an infinitesimal dipole, and we're going to talk about a radiation pattern, again, uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation. Our historical perspective today is Heinrich Hertz. He was a German physicist and he was the first person to ever generate, and it's kind of funny to call them airborne electromagnetic waves, but there were of course electromagnetic waves on transmission lines, but he was the first person to do what we're gonna talk about today, which is to create free flowing, free moving electromagnetic waves in free space. He was the first person to use both a dipole antenna, which we'll see today, and a loop antenna, which we'll talk about next time. And as a result of his very groundbreaking work, the unit of frequency the Hertz was named after him. So let's talk a little bit about electromagnetic radiation. We've already seen that static charges or motionless charges produce electric fields uh, and that they cause forces on other, on other charges. We've also talked about uh, uh, electrons or charges moving at a constant velocity uh, as an example of what we've called magnetostatics. And magnetostatics is, is when you create a constant magnetic field. Uh, and then the question that you might then ask is, well, we understand what happens when a particle is not moving. We understand when it's, what's happening when it's moving at a constant velocity. What happens when that particle accelerates? And the answer is that it creates an electromagnetic wave. You know, we've spent a lot of time talking about what happens to electromagnetic waves, but we've never talked about how to create or how to, uh, how to initiate an, an electromagnetic wave. And the answer is accelerate a charged particle. Uh, and if we do that, then electromagnetic waves will propagate away from that uh, accelerating charge at the speed of light. Uh, and then the next question you might ask would be, why is that? Why, why do we have to accelerate the charge? And that's going to take a little bit more effort to answer. This, uh, um, today's chapter in general has a lot of equations, but we're going to move through them pretty quickly because they're really just deriving the most important, I'll say, six or eight equations in the entire chapter. So I just want to remind you that we've already seen the pointing vector. The pointing vector says that if you're going to have uh, electromagnetic propagation, and then if you're talking about a, a wave that's propagating through space, then you're going to have the, uh, the pointing vector. That's going to be talking about what is the direction of motion of that, of that wave. Remember that we also saw that A sub S, which is the direction of propagation of, of the energy, is also equal to A sub K, where A sub K is the direction of motion of the particle, uh, of, of, the of, of the electromagnetic wave. So we understand that we need to have an electric field and a magnetic field. We understand that they, they generally, they can't be in the same direction because if they're in the same direction, then the cross product is gonna be equal to zero. Uh, and, and in general, we also know that they both need to be perpendicular to the direction that we expect the waves to propagate. Well, the, we expect the waves to propagate radially. And radially is one of those words that, that we throw around. It really just means that if you have a point, radially means pointing away from that point. Uh, and so we expect something that looks a lot like figure 29.1, where, the, uh, where the, the, the waves are propagating radially away uh, from, the, from the point charge or from the, uh, from, from the point source of, of electromagnetic waves. So we, we ask ourselves then, how could that come to be? Let's imagine that this particle, which is shown right here, is moving toward the right. And if that's moving toward the right, and if we use, uh, if we use our, put our thumb in the direction of, of, of that propagation, and then we wrap our fingers around, what we're gonna, that person has too many fingers. If we do that, then we're gonna find that, uh, that the, that the uh, magnetic waves on the top are going to be pointing out of the page. The magnetic waves on the bottom, our magnetic uh, uh, fields on the bottom are going to be pointing into the page. So that's where the directions of the red circles come from, is from the motion of the particle moving toward the right. And then what we know furthermore is because S equals E cross H, I can now predict what the direction of the electric field needs to be. 
The direction of the electric field, and again, you have to kind of think about the right hand rule. I'm going to put my four fingers in the direction of the, of the electric field. I'm going to curl those four fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, and my thumb is going to stick in the direction of, of, the, of the propagation of that wave. And so I've drawn here the direction that the electric fields need to be in order for, uh, in order for the, the, the wave to propagate radially, as we would expect. Uh, by the way, the opposite of radial, so uh, the opposite of radial is transverse. So if I refer to a wave as being transverse, that means that it's not radial. And so all of these blue lines, all of these electric field lines are transverse. Now there's a problem with transverse electric field lines, and that is that we don't, we don't see them. We, until this point in the course, we haven't seen transverse electric field lines. So far, all we've seen are radial electric field lines. Right, we've 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 uh, we've been very comfortable. I I, I guess uh, I can just draw it here. Um, we we've understand that if you have a point charge, whether it's moving or whether it's staying still, we expect that the electric field lines are going to point directly away from it. Uh, but those are radial, and what we need are transverse. So we've got a real conundrum here. We, we, we know that we need transverse electric field lines. We know that if we have a fixed uh, charge that it's just going to be uh, uh, radial. So we need to figure out how can we get those transverse electric field lines. Now we can predict some other things about these electric fields. We know that the radiated power that's coming away from, from, uh, from this accelerating charge is going to be equal to, this is S uh, dotted with DS, where this is, this is the pointing vector and this ds is referencing surface area. And so we've got some, uh, some point uh, source of uh, electromagnetic radiation, and it's going to be sending uh, s's out. So we've got s's that are going around, and then we're going to enclose these in a sphere. And wherever it crosses the sphere, we know that that was power that was being radiated away from that point source. And we can calculate this uh, because we know that each of those radial lines is going to be perpendicular to the surface of the sphere. That, that surface integral becomes just a, a multiplication. So we know that E is perpendicular to H. We know that the S vector that results from that cross product is perpendicular to the surface. So we can rewrite the equation in a much, much simpler form. Magnitude of E times magnitude of H times A. We furthermore know that the magnitude of the magnetic field has to be equal to the magnitude of the electric field divided by the the uh, you know the characteristic impedance of free space. We know that this is 377 ohms, but I'm not going to write that in my equations. Right, I'm just going to leave it as z sub zero for now. So if I plugged uh, uh, that equation uh, into uh, h here, so if that h goes right there, and then if I know that the uh, that that the surface of a sphere is four pi r squared, so that's the area of a sphere then I end up with e squared, uh, I guess you, you might say this is the magnitude of e squared, divided by z sub 0 times 4 pi r squared. Well, there's a problem here, and I know, that is that I know that whatever this particle is that's radiating, I know that the amount of energy that it's radiating, the power, amount of power that it's radiating, doesn't depend on r squared. Right? It, it isn't like, oh, here's a, here's a particle and it's radiating a certain amount. And if I measure it here, it's, measuring a, it's, it's, it's radiating a, a certain amount of energy. And if I measure it further out, it's radiating more energy or less energy. That's just not possible. We know that the amount of energy that it's radiating is constant. In the same way that the amount of light that comes out of a flashlight or the amount of light that comes out of a match is constant, it's just how big is the sphere that's going to encaps en en encapsulate it. So if that's the case, then whatever is going on in, in, in equation 29.4, this r squared needs to be canceled out with an r squared somewhere else. Well, 4 pi is a constant, z sub 0 is a constant, so the only place where it can cancel is e squared. So that means that e must be proportional to 1 over r. Because only if e is proportional to 1 over r will there will then be that the e squared will include a 1 over r squared, and then that would cancel with the r squared from 29.4. So we know two things. We know that the electric field needs to have a transverse component, and we know that its magnitude must vary as 1 over r. Well, here's that figure that I was looking for earlier. Um, if we have a static charge, or even a charge that's moving at a constant velocity, the electric field lines are going to be radial. And that's, that's not going to give us the transverse field that we need. Remember that, the, that the, the transverse field was the one that we showed up here with the blue lines? Those blue lines are, are perpendicular to the radial lines. And we, we must have transverse lines in order for us to have propagation of electromagnetic waves. So it turns out 
that we can do this by accelerating a particle. And so what, I'm, what I've done here is this is the standard approach to explaining how we get transverse electric field components. We're going to start out with, uh, with the, the particle in, in figure 29.2. So you remember that the, we had this one right here that was radiating electromag uh, just electric field lines going outward. What we haven't talked about until now very much is that those electric field lines are propagating at the speed of light. We know that everything has to propagate at the speed of light, and if we're in free space here, most, most, uh, most but not all antennas are in free space. So we're going to say it's propagating at C, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. That means that if this particle came into existence at a certain time, there's a, there's a point far enough away where you would not know that that, that, that particle had begun to radiate these, these lines because it, it, it wouldn't have gotten there yet. In the same way that if I'm far enough away and I, and I see you clap or shoot off a cannon, but I haven't heard it yet, that's because that's, that's still in flight. So if we briefly accelerate a particle for a time delta t, so we're going we're gonna to accelerate it just for a brief period of time delta t, and then it's going to maintain a constant velocity. So we accelerated it to a velocity v, and then it's going to maintain that constant velocity after the brief acceleration then the electric field lines that were emitted before the acceleration continue to propagate. And th those are these electric field lines out here. These are from before the acceleration. You know, it's, it's sort of like some major event has occurred, and, but these electric field lines don't reflect that major event. Those electric field lines are from before the change. Now, after the change, we have electric field lines that are, that are in here. And these electric field lines are, are shifted from the ones before the acceleration. And so we have, we have the ones that are here are from before, and the ones that are inside here are from after. Now, we don't have instantaneous acceleration, so that means that the particle is, is continuous. The particle exists at a certain point, but never is there a jump in its location. So we know that the electric field lines are also continuous. And that means that if they, if they are out here, for electric field lines that were emitted before the acceleration, and they're in here for particles, I'm sorry, for uh, electric uh, field lines that were emitted after the acceleration, then there has to be this continuous portion in the middle that's going to allow us to, to, to connect the dots, almost literally to connect the dots. But the electric field lines must be continuous. And so the red regions, and I'm going to erase my red marks on here, the red regions in figure 29.3 represent those, uh, those sort of uh, diagonal electric field lines, or sometimes it's referred to as kinks in the electric field lines, uh, and those kinks do in fact have a transverse component. You know, if, if you think, oh, here's the, here's the radial component, and here's the transverse component, well, certainly this line right here has both a radial and a transverse component. And that's what we need. We need to know what is the transverse component of those lines. By the way, and this is going to be something we're going to see over and over again, notice that over here and over here, there are not, in fact, transverse components. Those lines are not diagonal or kinked or bent. They're still straight. One of them is shorter and one of them is longer than it otherwise would have been, but it, it, they, are not, uh, they are not kinked in any way. So that means that we don't have transverse components in the directions of the acceleration or parallel to the direction of acceleration. The greatest amount of, of diagonal component is perpendicular to the direction of acceleration. And, and we're going to see that two more times before the end of today, that, that, that the, uh, the greatest amount of electromagnetic radiation is going to be perpendicular to the direction of acceleration. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to zoom in on this region right here. And that zoom in is going to look like this. So we know that we have an electric field line. This is up here. This is from before the acceleration. So this is from before the acceleration. This is from after the acceleration. And then this is because the, the lines must be continuous. And so we have, we have an electric field line that it looks like this, and it looks like this, and then in between it looks like this. And what we want to know is what is the transverse component of that uh, of that line that is diagonal, and we can we can calculate it. Uh, it turns out that that we're going to use this right triangle right here. So this right triangle, I'm really just making this entire figure red, so I'm not sure that's helpful. Um, this right triangle right here is going to help us to do that by by uh, sort of an issue of proportionality. We know that the distance that the wave will propagate um, is going to be c times delta t 
during the acceleration. We know that, uh, that this distance here is v times t, that's after the acceleration has occurred. And then along this distance is e sub zero, and along this distance is e sub t. So we can write an equation that's going to relate the ratio of e sub t to e sub zero to the ratio of v sub t to c delta t. And that's what this equation right here does. So equation 29.6 can then be solved. Um, we, we know what e sub zero is. That's, that's uh, Coulomb's law. We've been doing that for the whole, the whole book right now. Um, so we can, we can plug in. Uh, this one right here goes in for e sub zero. And then we're going to solve for e sub t. And that's equation 29.8. That gives us the transverse uh, uh, component. I'm going to take the v divided by the delta t. That's going to be the amount of acceleration that we had. So I'm going to pull that out. And that's what's happening uh, in the next step. Um, and I'm, I'm also going to take, I know that r is equal to c times t. So I'm going to take one of the two powers of r right here. I'm going to replace it with c times t. And that's where the c squared and the t come from right here. Uh, and then I know that this is the acceleration. And so then I can, I can also write that mu sub zero is equal to one over epsilon uh, times c squared. So I can simplify the equation down to uh, equation 29.10. So notice that we do in fact have a transverse electric field. And furthermore, we do in fact see that it's inversely proportional to r. So that's good because uh, one of our first uh, observations was that this had to have a one over r relationship. Um, and again, I just wanted to point out uh, that there's a directionality to this equation. And that directionality is, is, is talking about the fact that perpendicular to the direction of acceleration, we're going to have a large amount of, uh, of, the, uh, of the diagonal lines. So here again, we see that uh, in the perpendicular direction, the diagonal line is large. As we get closer and closer to parallel, it becomes less and less of a diagonal line. And when you are parallel, it's equal to zero. So as the particle is here and it accelerates in this direction, what we find is that it radiates waves in these directions, but it does not radiate waves in this direction. So that is not there. This directionality, or we'll call it directivity, of, of, the, of the wave pattern is actually going to be very desirable to us. Uh, we really want our antennas to be very directional. And so, uh, well, by and large, uh, if you're broadcasting something, then you don't want it to be directional. But quite often, we would like the, the, the antennas to be directional. And so, so we will come back and see that again. But I just want this to be an important picture that's in your head, is that as a particle is accelerating, that we expect the radiation to be perpendicular to the axis of acceleration. And we can represent that by including a sine of theta. Um, a sine of this, so this sine of theta in equation 29.11 comes from that, that directivity. So we now have an equation that relates, uh, we have Q. And by the way, the, more, the larger your charge is, the more the electric field will be. That's what I would expect. The larger the acceleration is, the larger the uh, electric field is going to be. The f so that's these two variables right here. The further away you are, the lower the electric field would be. And the closer you are to being perpendicular to the direction of, of acceleration, the greater the electric field is going to be. Everything else, the 4 pi and the mu sub 0, those are all constants. So, so those don't have any impact. But everything that we would expect is, in fact, appearing in this equation. So we're feeling really good about that. Uh, let's do an example problem. So we have, uh, we have a charged particle with a 0.1 Coulomb charge accelerated on, along the positive x-axis at a rate of 10 meters per second squared. So it's a pretty big charge, but on the scale of, of electron motion or of charge motion, 10 meters per second squared is very small acceleration. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not expecting very much to be coming out of this. What is the magnitude of the transverse electric field two meters away at an angle of 45 degrees? So E sub t is equal to q divided by 4 pi multiplied by a over r times mu sub 0 sine theta. And that is equal to 0 0.1 coulombs divided by 4 pi times the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared divided by 2 meters is the distance times 1.2566 times 10 to the negative 6 times the sine of 45 degrees. And this works out to be 35.3 nanovolts per meter.
And so, as expected, not very much acceleration, so we aren't going to see very much of a, an electric field. Um, we actually wouldn't expect there to be very much of an electric field. I mean, this 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 kink in the electric field line is is not the most significant effect, um, but it is the entire reason. It is the entire reason by which we are able to transmit electromagnetic waves. So, although the strength isn't very great, uh, we are very very happy that this works. Now we can next, now that we know the electric field, we can next find the magnetic field. H then, the magnitude of H is equal to the magnitude of E divided by Z sub zero. That's kind of the definition of, of the characteristic impedance of free space. So if we substitute equation 29.11 for the electric field into that equation, really the only thing that's different, different between the electric field and the magnetic field is the Z sub zero. But we can go one step further. You'll notice that we have a Z sub zero and we have a mu sub zero. It seems wasteful to have those two constants when uh, they can be related to each other. And so if we uh, use z sub 0 equals the square root of mu sub 0 over epsilon 0, we can then uh, get rid of uh, the z sub 0. And then the mu sub 0 is going to cancel with the square root in the denominator, leaving just a mu sub, uh, mu sub 0 in the numerator. And that gives you a square root of epsilon 0 times the square root of mu sub 0. So this term right here is the product of those two constants, but that is just one over the speed of light. So if I take that square root out of the numerator and I put a C in the denominator, that, ba that balances each other out. So um, any of these expressions for H would give the correct result. It's just a question of trying to find the one that's the most compact and kind of the, the most convenient for us to use. So let's do an example here. The magnitude of H is going to be equal to, and I won't rewrite the equation because it's literally right there, it's 0.1 coulombs uh, times the acceleration, which is 10 meters per second squared, divided by 4 pi times 3 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, uh, and then we are 2 meters away, and then that's uh, times the sine of 45 degrees. And that works out to be 93.8 pico amps per meter. You'll remember that the units of H are amps per meter. This is 93.8 times 10 to the minus 12th amps per meter. So the electric field was pretty weak. Then you divide it further by uh, Z sub zero, another 377, it becomes even smaller. So uh, these, are, these are not substantial numbers, but they are important numbers because with the right uh, receiving antenna, we could detect this motion if we wanted to. Now we can also uh, calculate the, uh, the, uh, the, the pointing vector. You remember that the pointing vector s is equal to e cross h. Uh, but we also, back, way back in the, in the very first figure, we saw that, that if, we, if we have, say, an electric field that is, uh, I'm sorry, a magnetic field that is pointing out of the screen. Let me think about this for just a quick second. Yeah, and then and the electric field is pointing this way. If you put your fingers in the direction of e and you curl them in the direction of h, you get the direction of s. And so we know that, that if, the, if the source particle is down here, that the S has to be radiated in a way. And so we don't even really need to worry about the actual cross product because we know that the electromagnetic radiation is going to be radiated in a way. This is one of the great things about uh, spherical coordinates is that we can just write A sub R. So I have an expression here that represents the, the, uh, the uh, magnitude of E. This is an expression for the magnitude of H. When I multiply them together, a lot of those quantities get squared. Uh, the mu sub zero is not squared and the C is not squared because uh, we, the, each one of them only occurs in their, in their own individual equation. Remember that essentially the, the, the C comes from the, the addition of a Z sub zero. But everything else is going to get squared in, in that equation. So let's do a, another quick calculation here. Um, S is equal to uh, Q squared divided by 16 pi squared, 16 pi squared times a squared over c r squared times mu sub zero sine squared theta. And we're doing this for the same example problem that we've done in the past. So this is gonna be 0.1 coulomb squared divided by 16 pi squared uh, times 10 meters per second squared, that quantity is squared, divided by three times 10 to the eighth and then uh, that is not squared, but then r is squared, 2 squared, um, times mu, 1.2566 times 10 to the minus sixth, and then that's multiplied by the sine squared of, whoops, I, is it, let me just check what the number was there. It was 45 degrees. 
So sine squared of 45 degrees. And that works out to be a very, very small number, 4.689 times 10 to the minus 18th and the units of uh, the pointing vector are watts per meter squared. Watts per meter squared. So let's see, 10 to the minus 12th is pico, 10 to the minus 15th is femto, 10 to the minus 18th is addo. So we could write 4.689 addo watts per meter squared. So this is a very, very small amount of, of, uh, of energy. It would be very difficult for us to detect that. But after all, it is, a, it is just a small amount of charge moving. It's not a small amount of charge. It's a, it's a reasonable amount of charge, but, but accelerating very slowly. <clears throat> Finally, we can integrate s over a, a surface area. And so we're going to take our, our expression here for s, and we're going to take our expression here for this is ds, and essentially we're now we're going to integrate over a surface. And there's, there's several things that happen here. The r squareds are going to cancel. Uh, the sine theta is going to combine with this sine squared and become sine cubed. a sub r dotted with a sub r is going to go away, <clears throat> and we end up with equation 29.20. Now q squared is a constant, 16 pi squared is a constant, a is a constant, c is a constant, mu sub zero is a constant. We pull all of that out in front of the integral. Um, and then when we do the integration with respect to phi, we just get 2 pi uh, because there was really no phi dependence. So it was an integration that gave us just a constant. Uh, and then when we integrate sine cubed of theta, that's equal to 4 thirds. And I could show you three more steps that would prove that. Or you could go to Wolfram Alpha, or you could use Maple or MATLAB. Um, but I think you'll trust me that this, the integral from 0 to pi of sine cubed theta uh, d theta is equal to 4 thirds. So we end up with equation 29.22. Uh, simplifying that, let's see. How can we simplify the pi? Cancels with pi squared. Um, the 4 and the 2 become 8. Cancels with the 16 to leave 2 behind. 2 times 3 gives you this 6. Um, Q squared, A squared, and C and mu sub zero all stick around. We're left with this expression uh, for the radiated power. Now we also know uh, that uh, that we can rewrite mu in this form, one over C squared times ep times epsilon zero. And if we plug that in for the mu right here, again, it's not clear whether this is a preferable form. But we end up with this expression. And the reason why I wanted this expression is because this is known as the Larmor formula. And if you look uh, on the internet about uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, emanating away from an accelerating charge, or if you look in a, in a, a really good physics textbook, you're going to find the Larmor formula. And it really does come down to just fundamental constants. And then, of course, as you would expect, the more charge there is and the more you're accelerating it, uh, the more radiation that's going to be propagating away. That's the total radiation that's captured by the entire sphere that surrounds that. And it doesn't depend on the radius of the sphere, so that's nice. So let's uh, calculate what is that total power uh, from our example. The radiated power is equal to the Q squared times the A squared divided by 6 pi times 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12th. And then that's divided by 3 times 10 to the 8th cubed. It's the only place I've ever seen C cubed to appear in any of these equations. Uh, and that gives us 2.22 times 10 to the minus 16th watts. So the total amount of, of uh, power that is, is, is uh, radiating away from that accelerating charge, 2.22 times 10 to the minus 16th watts. That is a larger number than what we found in the previous example. But remember that that was that this example is, wait for it, this example is a particular point. So 10 to the minus 18th, you know, if we've got a, we've got a, a, a sphere here that's going to be uh, 2 meters in radius, we would expect that it would be uh, higher if we were capturing all of the energy. And in, in example 29.4, now we're capturing all of the energy, we go up by a couple powers of 10. An important note to observe here, uh, and that is everything in this derivation that we've just been talking about and everything that's to follow in the rest of the book, really, is, is omitting any discussion of relativity. So that means that the particle is not accelerating close to the speed of light. It means that we are not far enough away from the accelerating particle that we need to account for the speed of light. Uh, it means that uh, essentially we are non-relativistic. Uh, 
And if you want to know how these equations get uh, include relative relativity, uh, it, it gets a lot more complicated. This is what we call electrodynamics. And electrodynamics is a whole subject that we are not going to take the time to go into, we don't have the time to go into. Uh, but if, you, if you'd like to take it in graduate school or buy a book on electrodynamics, um, there's a lot of good stuff going on there. It's just that for a typical electrical and computer engineer, it's not as relevant as, as the non-relativistic effects. Okay, let's talk about how we, how we can practically accelerate charges. Because the example that we just saw was talking about, I've got a charge and it's going to accelerate along a straight line. And that, of course, is the very first way that we talk about acceleration. But then in practice, there are really two ways that we see continuous acceleration. Because we don't want to just have a burst of acceleration. We want to have acceleration occurring all the time. One of these is, is if you uh, accelerate in one direction, then you s slow down, and then you stop, and you reverse direction and go back the other way, sort of like a pendulum swinging back and forth. That's what happens in a dipole antenna. In a dipole antenna, we're going to send charge one direction, then it's going to reverse, and it's going to go the other direction, then it's going to reverse, and it's going to go back the other direction again. A dipole antenna is really just, it's just uh, you have a transmission line coming in, and then you take part of it and you go one direction, you take the other part and you go the other direction, you put a couple of plates on the ends here, and that's a dipole antenna. And uh, it's, it's as simple as you can imagine, uh, and certainly if it's an infinitesimal dipole, a very, very, very tiny dipole, um, that is the simplest antenna that we can study. And then that'll also be the building block for studying all other types of antennas. Now the other way that you can think about uh, ex constant acceleration is to have centripetal acceleration. So you know, if you took a a rock on a string, or if you talk, talk about like a merry-go-round, or if you talk about like a satellite orbiting the Earth. Those are all examples of some tripetal acceleration, and that's going to be something we're going to see in like a loop antenna. So a loop antenna is going gonna, is gonna to be the other example of a realistic antenna that we can work with. We'll talk about infinitesimal dipoles today. Uh, next time we'll talk, about, um, we'll talk about finite dipoles, and then we'll eventually talk about loop antennas as well. Um, for an infinitesimal dipole, we're going to assume that the length of the antenna, and I should come back up here and say that the length of the antenna is this distance here. So the length of the antenna is going to be much, much less than the wavelength of the signal that we're transmitting. And in practice, what that means is that it is less than 1 50th, less than 2% of the wavelength. Um, you know, sometimes much, much less than means 1 10th. Here it really does need to be much, much less than, less than 1 50th. So you can see here, we have a transmission line that's bringing the signal in. So there's going to be some sort of a, probably a sine wave along that line. And when it gets to the end, one of the conductors is going to go north and the other conductor is going to go south. And the total length of that line is going to be L. And then we have some uh, observation point out here. So at the observation point, then we're going to be, uh, we're going to be sensing what is the amount of electromagnetic radiation at that point. Well, that point is a distance r away from the center of the dipole antenna, and it is at an angle of theta relative to the relative to the direction of the antenna. And so it's not relative to the to the perpendicular, it's relative to the to the axis of the antenna. Now, of course, the way that I've the way that I've drawn this, um, it looks like L and R are pretty similar to each other. <clears throat> but in practice, we're also going to be very, very far away from the antenna. Um, and so that'll be, that'll be an important observation that we'll make here in just a minute. So we have the dipole antenna, infinitesimal. Now I know you've probably really missed the discussion that we had of magnetic vector potential. So I'm going to flash back, maybe you're going to have a flashback, of equation 12.7, where we were able to derive uh, the magnetic vector potential from a, from a general current density. We really do have to go back to that because uh, this is the general tool that we have for converting from a current density. Uh, we go to the magnetic vector potential and from there we can go to the magnetic field. So we can take this quantity, J of R prime times DV prime, and we can, uh, if we take that DV prime, we can separate it into a DS times a DL. So think about it as, you know, you've got a cylinder like this. We have ds, and then over here we have a dl. And if you multiply those together, you get the dv, the, the volume. And so uh, we can take now, we can combine the j of r with the ds, because if we have a j that's coming out the end here, and you multiply it by the surface area, that's where you get the i. 
So j times ds gives you an i. The direction, well, the way, the way that we're drawing it, the direction is in the a sub z direction. So that's where this vector is coming from. And then the dl is just going to stick around. Probably should have put a tick mark right there, so it's dl prime. Um, furthermore, we're going to assume that we're applying a time harmonic signal to the antenna. So that means that we can write the current as a time harmonic signal. Uh, where it's going to have an amplitude of i sub 0 and then the e to the minus jkr. There's also a, an a e to the j omega t component as well. <clears throat> so uh, we can now take, uh, take this quantity of i, we can plug it into here, and we're going to take all of this combined and we're going to plug it into there. And that's where we get this expression, 29.30. Uh, you'll see that here's the, here's the expression that we had for i. We still have the 1 over r that, that was up here in the original equation. And then we have the dl a sub z that came from uh, the dl a sub z here. Uh, again, probably should have a tick mark on that one. We're going to integrate from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. We're going to take the origin at the center of the antenna. And then we still have the mu sub 0 over 4 pi has carried down here as well. Well, if you just look at that expression, um, there, th the problem would be that as you integrate along the length of the line, let's imagine that we have the antenna is over here. And if I take a point that's fairly close, as I'm integrating along the length of the line here, the distance to r is going to change, right? So it'll be further away when we're closer to the ends of the line. It'll be closer when we're closer to the middle of the antenna. That's true unless we take that point and we move that point way far away. So if I'm going to, uh, and, and I'll just try to, I'll try to show that it's like here. If I do that, then really this distance is really quite similar to that distance. And so then I don't need to worry about the variation of r. But that means that r has to be really far away. And so we're going to take this as the far field. r is much, much greater than lambda. And so we know that r is much, much greater than lambda. And we know that lambda is much, much greater than the length of the line. And so we've got this, this relationship here that shows those three variables. And, and this is referred to as the far field. So we're going to be in the far field. We're not going to be right up next to the antenna. Some weird things happen right close to the antenna. I don't know if you've ever observed that. Like, if you're listening to a good, solid uh, radio station, we used to listen to radio stations when I was a kid, and you'd drive right past the radio tower, uh, and you'd think, wow, this should be the place where this, the signal is the very strongest. But sometimes it would kind of cut out right near the radio tower. That's because you're not in the far field. So if, you, if you're in the far field, then you're going to get a nice, smooth uh, signal. And you're also going to find that this integral is very easy because this r doesn't now vary. It doesn't vary with l. Obviously, that's a constant. Um, that doesn't vary with l. Nothing varies with l. So really, it just becomes an integral from negative l over 2 to positive l over 2. And that, that just becomes l. So the integral becomes quite easy. It's in the a sub z direction, but that requires that it be in the far field. Now, we've done all of this in rectangular coordinates because that was very convenient. You know, we had the antenna was, was, in rec was, it was lined up with the rectangular coordinates, but now we really have to, to convert this into spherical coordinates because we're about to start propagating a wave. And when we propagate the wave, it needs to be in, in, in spherical coordinates. So what I've done here is I've just taken this, uh, this picture that is, is, uh, t shows how the spherical coordinates work. I just want to remind you that the, the theta that was here can be replicated right here as well. And if we do that, then this a sub z can, can be expressed in terms of a sub r and a sub theta. Now, a sub theta is in the direction where you would rotate theta. So that means that a sub theta is pointing this way. And, but the z is going to have a component in the negative a sub theta direction. So what we're going to find is that we can convert a sub z into a sub r times the cosine of theta. I'm sorry, a sub r is equal to a sub z times the cosine of theta, and a sub theta is equal to negative a sub z sine of theta. So remember that this theta, you can take the opposite, and that opposite is going to be in the negative a theta direction. That's going to be the sine. And the cosine is the adjacent, and that's going to give you the, the a sub r component. So that picture, maybe that wasn't necessary. Maybe you would have taken my word on these two equations, but I wanted to be able to prove it to myself. So I can now take what used to be a sub z, this used to be a sub z, and now I've rewritten it in terms of a sub r and a sub theta. So now we have a sub uh, a of r, the magnetic vector potential in spherical coordinates. We can now use it to solve uh, for, uh, for the magnetic uh, field.
magnetic flux density. So the magnetic flux density in spherical coordinates, we're going to calculate that. Um, we're going to calculate it to, to find H of R. So H of R is going to, is going to be these two partial derivatives here. Uh, when I do those two partial derivatives, I get one that has a 1 over R and another one that has 1 over R squared. But remember that R is a very, very large number here. We're in the far field. So that means that we can ignore the one that has 1 over R squared in preference for the one that has just 1 over R. So I have to now say it's approximately equal, but that approximately is true if you're in the far field. Uh, and so I can take everything else. Uh, the, the J in the denominator is going to become a negative J in the numerator, and that negative sign is going to cancel with the original negative sign. Everything else is really going to stick around the way that it used to be. And we end up with, finally, our expression for the magnetic field being caused by, uh, by a, uh, an infinitesimal dipole. Notice, by the way, that we get this same sine of theta that we expected to see. Uh, and that sine of theta came in, it's, it's really from the same source as, as the sine of theta that was in the accelerating charge. So the magnitude of h in this problem is equal to ki sub 0 times l divided by uh, 4 pi r divided by 4 pi r times the sine of theta. I don't need to include the j. That j doesn't need to be included because I'm looking for the magnitude. And the magnitude of e to the minus jkr is always equal to 1, so those are excluded. Uh, and, and the unit vector doesn't need to be included, but everything else is included here. Um, let's see, what was k? Well, I know that lambda is equal to c divided by f, and c is 3 times 10 to the 8th. And the f was given in the problem statement as 1 times 10 to the 6th. So this is 300 meters. And I, oops, pardon me. And I know that uh, k is equal to 2 pi divided by lambda, and that's going to be equal to 2 pi over 300, and that's equal to 0 0.021 meters to the minus 1. So the magnitude of h is 0 0.021 times i sub 0. This has an amplitude of 1 amp, so that's times 1 times the length, the length is one centimeter, so that's 0 0.01, divided by four pi times, and how far away am I? I am five meters away. So let me just, by the way, take a moment here and consider, is five meters much, much greater than one centimeter? Yeah, it's 500 times more. So I'm, I'm in the far field, so I'm feeling good about that, divided by five meters, and that's multiplied by the sine of 30 degrees, and when I plug all that into my calculator, I get 1.67 microamps per meter. And the units of H are amps per meter, but it came out to be microamps per meter. So uh, one thing to observe is that this is much larger than the amount of magnetic field that was caused by that simple accelerating charge. Antennas work well at transmitting power, uh, transmitting electromagnetic waves. Uh, what we're going to find next time, or actually in, in a subsequent lesson, is that infinitesimal dipole antennas are terrible. You would never actually use an infinitesimal dipole. Um, you know, m with the exception of maybe in your cell phone, uh, you would never want to try to have an antenna that was this short. You want the antenna to be uh, quite a bit longer. We'll talk more about how long would we like it to be, uh, but, but a one centimeter antenna, that's not going to be very good. So uh, while we are happy with the 1.67 microamps per meter, uh, we're going to be able to do, a, to do a lot better than that in the future. We can now calculate E of R. E of R is 1 over J omega times epsilon 0 uh, times the curl of H. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so we can then uh, we can calculate the curl of H in spherical coordinates. It gets a little bit difficult here, uh, but ultimately, I'm, I'm kind of uh, skipping a couple of steps here for your sanity. Uh, ultimately, we get an expression for the electric field that corresponds to that same, uh, that same situation. So let's calculate what is the electric field. Um, e, I'll say the magnitude of E. Now I have two choices. I can take, I'll omit this part, and I'll omit this part, and I'll omit this part, just as I did before, and I can plug everything else in. Or I can recognize that everything else, everything else here, all of this, is the expression that I just did for H. And the only thing that's extra is the Z sub 0. So I can say that the magnitude of E is equal to Z sub 0 times the magnitude of H, which again is kind of the definition of Z sub 0. So I can save myself some time, or I can use that to check my work. You know, at the end, you can divide E by H, and if you get Z sub zero, then you're gonna feel really good about 
your, your answer being correct. So this is 377 times 1.67 times 10 to the minus sixth, and that is equal to 630 microvolts per meter. Again, much better than we got with a simple accelerating charge. Now we're going to take the uh, we're going to find the average pointing vector for this antenna. It's just remember that that the the pointing vector is going to vary from time to time. It's going to vary over the cycle because we have sinusoidal signals here. So we have to do two things to find the average. We have to take the complex conjugate of the of the magnetic field, and we have to take one half times the real part of that of of the of the uh, of the e cross h star. So we have uh, we have one half times the real part of here's our e that's e crossed with h that's our h uh, we know the a sub theta crossed with a sub phi is going to give us an a sub r that's great news because we know that the the electromagnetic radiation must be radiating away radially and I'm going to take all of these other quantities let's see the j and the negative j j times negative j times j gives negative one that cancels out the other negative one e to the negative jkr cancels e to the plus jkr. And a lot of these other things are going to get squared. The 4 and the pi get squared, the k, the i sub 0, the l get squared, the r gets squared, the sine gets squared. z sub 0 doesn't get squared, and the 1 half doesn't get squared. But it looks like everything else in this equation ends up getting squared. So I can calculate s average is equal to 1 half times 377 times 0 0.021 times 1 times 0 0.01, the quantity squared, divided by 16 pi squared, uh, and then times 1 over 5 squared, times the sine squared of 30 degrees, and that works out to be 5.26 times 10 to the minus 10th watts per meter squared. And uh, just as a reminder, oh, and I should say that's the magnitude of S average. And the magnitude of S average, by the way, is equal to 1 half times the magnitude of E times the magnitude of H. So you can also check your work. Uh, and I did, in fact, check that this is equal to 1 half times the results of the previous two examples. Now, I just want to really draw your attention to the fact that this, um, this radiation, uh, this vector, S average, which represents how much power is being radiated, depends on sine squared theta. And that sine squared theta says that not only is it that the, the electric field has a sine of theta and the magnetic field has the sine of theta, but the power has the sine squared of theta. And all of them say that the, the amount of radiation is going to be perpendicular to the antenna. Notice that this little red thing right here, I've tried to indicate that that's the antenna. That's the infinitesimal dipole. I've shown it to be very short because, uh, because it is infinitesimally small. Um, what we find is that perpendicular, so in the directions that are perpendicular, we're going to find that we have the highest amount of energy radiated away. And in the directions that are parallel, we're going to find that there is no energy radiated away. And one way to represent that is what we call a polar plot. And MATLAB has a polar plot function. All I did here was in MATLAB, I, I set up a, a, a variable of theta, and then I, and then I set up a variable, uh, and then I calculated uh, s according to this equation. I calculated s according to this equation, and then I did a polar plot of s as a function of theta, and I end up with this. And, and really what, what happens is these lines right here, so these lines like this one, these radial lines represent the amplitude of the function at different, uh, at different angles. So the polar plot is a way of, of, of indicating or of measuring what is the angular dependence of the signal. And so we can see that it is definitely the strongest. It is the strongest there, and it is the strongest here. But you know what? I kind of wondered, how quickly does that drop off? And the answer is, I don't know. If I were to, if I were to try to capture that, I would say that you know it's probably pretty strong uh, over about a 60 degree range. So it's pretty strong in, up there and then similarly about 60 degrees over here. And gosh, within this range here, uh, which is uh, maybe again about 60 degrees, there's really not much going on in there. Those, those signals are very weak. We call the strong portions of, of, the, of the polar plot the lobes and we call the weak portions the nulls. Now in this case, the nulls actually go all the way to zero. There is zero power being radiated uh, parallel to the, to the antenna. The nulls don't necessarily have to go all the way to zero, although they often do. Uh, and then the lobes, 
it's kind of like the lobes on a brain or like the lobes on a, on on various biological things. So you're going to see that the lobes are going to be the direction of of maximum value. We're going to come back and see polar plots like crazy. So I I just wanted you to see that this is the first time that you're seeing a polar plot, which we also sometimes call a radiation pattern. Uh, now, finally, the last thing we're going to do is figure out what's the total power that's being radiated by this antenna across the whole surface. So uh, in all directions, if we integrate it, uh, we're going to start off with this is our expression for S. So that's our S. And then this is the DS in spherical coordinates. So we have an R squared sine theta d theta d phi a sub r. Well, when we dot product a sub r with a sub r, we just get 1. The r squared is going to cancel with the r squared. The sine is going to become a sine cubed. And this probably looks just like the derivation we did for the acceleration. Um, and in fact, it is. Uh, we can pull out all the constants. Uh, when we do the integral with respect to phi, we just add a 2 pi. And when we do that integral of sine cubed d theta uh, from 0 to pi, we get the same 4 thirds that we got before. We can do one step of simplification here, and we end up with this, this, uh, this product right here, which represents this is the total power that's radiated away from, a, from an infinitesimal dipole antenna. So obviously, then, we're going to wrap up by seeing what is the radiated power for the antenna that we've been studying, 377 times 0 0.021 times 1, that's the, the maximum current, times L, which is 1 centimeter. All of that is squared divided by 12 pi. And that works out to be 441 nanowatts. And that's not very much power, but it is enough for us to detect. And so uh, we're going to find that very, very small amounts of power can be detected by good antennas that are attached to good amplifiers. Uh, but, but of course, if we're the ones designing the amplifiers, we'd like the antennas to be as good as they can be. And if we're designing the antennas, we'd like the amplifiers to be as good as they can be. In this class, we're focusing on the antennas, so we're going to try to optimize the antennas. But we're going to rely on the fact that there are good amplifiers out there if we need to rely on them. OK, so we've understand now that, that if you have an accelerating charge, it's going to create a transverse electric field. And we have an equation for that. Transverse electric field is going to be corresponding to a magnetic field. We have an equation for that. When combined, we can calculate the, uh, the pointing vector that corresponds to, to, uh, to the accelerating charge. And then we can integrate that over a surface to find the Larmor formula. So the Larmor formula is a very well-known uh, way of calculating the total power radiated away from an accelerating charge. We're really not going to talk very much about accelerating charges after today. We're going to focus on antennas, but it's good to know that we can calculate the total, or the total power being radiated by an accelerating charge. If we have an infinitesimal dipole uh, where lambda is, or I'm sorry, L is less than lambda over 50, then we can calculate the electric and magnetic field. We calculate the magnetic vector potential. From that, we get the magnetic field. From there, we get the electric field. We can then calculate the corresponding average pointing vector. Uh, that has a lot of those terms are squared, and then the total radiated power looks like this.